everybody, and welcome to episode three, I guess, of Silver Screen Anomalies. I mean, we can count that high. We can. I think it's three. Yeah, we can. I promise um, we can count that high. As previously mentioned, though we're not math students, we're pretty sure we can at least count to three. I mean, four. Fuck. Three. Three. We're I at three. I can count a potato. There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, welcome back. And just a refresher, as we do at the beginning of every episode, this is not a spoiler-free podcast. If you plan on seeing these movies and you don't want spoilers, turn off the player now, please. Yeah, we're going to wreck it. We will wreck it, and we will not feel bad because you have been warned. Oh, also we get real salty. We oh, swear yeah. sometimes. Uh, Sometimes? I, swear. I think I just swore like... 15 seconds ago yeah i swear constantly I, yeah I, it's that's, just the that's way a it lie. is we also lie there we go I'm oh a... my god what yeah oh all right so um we've got a couple of pretty interesting movies to talk about today we're we're pretty excited we have first up to bat skylar take it away okay really excited about this one so our first movie on the docket today is scary stories to tell in the dark uh that's a 2019 film that was just released in theaters Directed by Andre Oberdahl uh, and produced by Guillermo del Toro. My boy. Woo! Uh, so, synopsis. In the small town of Mill Valley, a dormant shadow looms in the form of the Bellows family and their now generations-old mansion. But within its walls are secrets, namely in the form of a mysterious book written by the young Sarah Bellows. A book with stories of unrelenting terror. Stories that become all too real for a group of unsuspecting teens who stumble onto the book of horrors while trick-or-treating on one fateful Halloween night. Yeah. It's got all the makings of a good good tale there. It's got all of the ingredients so, for... So, yeah, and a little bit of background on this for yeah. anyone who doesn't know, and if you don't know, where were you in the 90s? This is based on a trio of books called, wait for it, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, that were... <laughs> it's in the title, yeah. Yeah, pretty campy. They were, come on, they they were really campy. Okay, no, I feel with like it, you're... With a couple of exceptions. I feel like you're not giving them their due justice. So, okay. I can, Go this on. Is, this is probably a little bit of a depiction of what this review is going to be like for the two of us because I feel like I'm going to be a little bit higher on the scale compared to you. Cause I, mean, I, yeah, I mean, maybe. Maybe, we'll see. We'll see. So there's a little bit of nostalgia that comes along with this particular uh, movie and its source material. The source material in question, for those of you who were a part of the Scholastics Book Fair era of... Go team! Yeah. For those of us that were in that camp, these books were totally awesome and you were the cool kid in the class if you got these books because they were actually pretty high bar spooky horror stuff for the, I don't know, like eight to 12 year old range wait you were the cool kid for having these books oh very good i was i was <laughs> always just the weird kid for having these books i mean it was almost like a daring situation where i was from uh picking oh. up these books because they were actually kind of upsetting now granted yeah i mean to go speak back to what you were saying uh if you were to read these now of course they're going to be corny and a little silly some of the stories are genuinely well done but for the most part here these are a series of very very short stories uh it's gateway horror for mm. a younger audience um i think it's fair to say though as gateway horror the books the movie mm -hmm. is genuinely upsetting in parts, and I love it. Oh, yeah. This is this is where I am like, you might be surprised. Who knows? Ooh. My review might not be as scathing as you think. I actually, uh, I enjoyed this movie. I love this movie. This was really quite interesting. There were only a couple of things that I had uh, had some problems with, which we will get to. But yeah, overall, I thought it was really fun. We have the, the kids were all very colorful characters, all mm -hmm. kind of diverse with different backgrounds and personalities. Their motivations, the main character, um, or the lead protagonist, I should say, Stella Nichols, mm -hmm. um, I related to her a yeah. lot because she was uh, kind of in the outside group at school. She writes her own scary stories. She's trying to, to become a writer herself, um, which is something I can completely relate to because that was me. I was the kid that was writing really weird and terrible <laughs> stories in her books at school. 
Absolutely. And I think for any, uh, I guess, young person that's coming into this that has sort of an affiliation or an interest in horror, to speak back to what we were saying before about the books, how they were basically like gateway horror books for children, this movie, I actually 100% think it's a great gateway horror film. Granted, there is some. I would. Uh, oh my God. There are. <laughs> Which moments, one do you want to talk about? Oh my about? <laughs> God. There's genuinely upsetting stuff in this movie. Genuinely. It, it pushes the PG 13 rating oh as boy. far as it possibly can. And. And then it some. worked. Yeah, it it, worked. it's it's great. Like I I was so shocked. I when I heard that this movie was being adapted based on the books, and I heard it was going to be PG thirteen, I was a little apprehensive only because some of the content in these stories despite them being written for children there there's potential to go really lurid and push it really far and mm-hmm. i was a little concerned that the movie was going to feel a little like neutered or leashed um on a collar it doesn't at all like nope. no not at all this movie really goes for it and we'll we'll kind of like put a pin in that particular conversation because i want to play off of the special effects in this movie a lot yes. later well we'll touch mm-hmm. that later but to speak to what you were saying about the the characters i think the characters feel very fitting like they're very yeah. well realized and it, they fall very much into the camp of we're in an era now where 80s nostalgia and nostalgia in general is being played up a lot in mm-hmm. different plot elements and especially horror because look at stranger things look at it and yeah. the cataclysm of success that those two properties alone have done for the genre uh, of course, we're, uh, Hollywood is going to capitalize off of this, but normally with these trends and these movements that move forward, uh, one can get a little sick of it. I mean, i.e. the superhero thing that's been going now for, oh my God, forever. Um, yeah. You know, like it can feel a little tired eventually at a point where you're they're retreading a lot of the same plot elements and things like that. But I don't feel that way about this current trend. I feel like bring on more because what they're doing is, is they're hauling out these really talented people, makeup artists, production designers, and directors out of the woodwork and letting them be creative Mm -hmm. to make these gorgeously realized movies that, to be honest with you, would be something that I would have loved when I was a kid. Like, I I absolutely would have loved this. I would have eaten it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. If I were younger, I think that this would have impacted me in a much different way. That said, I was still very unnerved by several points in the movie. Good Lord. Um, It's got a little bit of everything, doesn't it? It really does. I think the only problem that I really had with the movie was the ending. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you've got this book. And the whole thing is that this book is writing itself. And the stories that it's writing are coming to life. You know, the creatures that they're writing about and the people that they're writing about are actual people in the town, friends of Stella's for Mm -hmm. the most part, friends or enemies. Um, And they're coming to life and they're being written as you watch in blood. And it's just like, okay, that's, that's something. So you got this book that's writing its own stories and then you've got to stop it because your friends are in danger. So naturally you go to destroy it, Mm -hmm. right? That's a bit, that that's a very odd place to put destroying the book. They put destroying trying to destroy the book early in the movie. Yeah. And as a result, it seemed like the ending was soft to me. I would actually agree with that. And I think a lot of the issue here is is that they kind of wrote themselves into a corner. Yes. Because you have this tremendous setup. Something I was going to compliment the movie on was how seamlessly the plot actually interweaves these short stories from the oh, nostalgic yeah. book series into the plot. Like it actually does it really, really well. Like they feel like set pieces, but they're not just like one scene after another of set pieces. It mm-hmm. feels like it's actually part of the plot. Like it's interconnected really well. And even like the setup towards getting the book, I was actually kind of blown away. Now, a lot of good horror films are guilty of this. But the whole idea of having a spooky book that no one would ever open or read is very common in horror. Like everything from like the Evil Dead has done it. Mm -hmm. Um, In the Evil Dead, it works because that's playing off of two different subgenres of horror. Like it's playing off of like a horror comedy thing. So it works in that regard. You can disregard the silly character motivations. This movie takes itself very seriously. Oh, yeah. uh, Which 
took me by surprise, I'll be honest. Oh, it makes a big difference, too. It does. So tonally, the movie is playing into a very serious tone. So you need to have a very serious motivation for these characters to dabble with this book. And the way that they wind up into the mansion, being bullied into the mansion, quite literally, by an antagonist character, and then being funneled into the basement where they were trapped, the only way that they could get out was to use the book, which was hypothesized by the lead character, Stella, who believed in kind of the stories revolving around the mansion and, and the bellows themselves. So they used the book to get out of the basement, which I actually thought was quite clever. Yeah. Well, they kind of used the book. Uh, it's So the whole background with Sarah Bellows, the original writer of the book, was trapped into her inner house by her family and erased from all the pictures and paintings in yeah. the house. So nobody knew what she looked like. And then children would come to the house, to the to wall in the basement where she was, and she would whisper stories to them. And then, you know, the characters, I think they actually go into the house initially as a dare to each other. And then yes. when they're in the basement, they get locked in by the bully who meets a very delightful end. <laughs> oh yeah. We'll talk more about that later because we can like, we can speak to each of the, like the set pieces later. Cause then I'm, I'm yeah. sure we have a lot to talk about there, but oh my God. yeah, I may have like, uh, over embellished when I said that they got bullied into the house. It was yeah. more like once they were in the house, they were bullied into the basement. The bully locks them in. Yeah. The bully does lock them yeah. in. Yeah. As they're trying to leave the house, I think he shows up and then yeah, pushes and them in. Yeah, and causes shit because yeah. they, they lit a bag of shit on fire and threw it into his car, which was, <laughs> which was delightful. delightful. Very, uh, uh, very 80s. Do uh, people still do that, I wonder? I don't know. If anyone... Oh, I guess we can't really ask. Have you lit ask. a bag of shit on fire and left it on someone's doorstep and or slash thrown it into a car? Uh, Please comment. <laughs> Send us an email. We won't tell the police. Yeah, we won't tell anyone. Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah. I want to know if I can do this. I mean, yeah. I want to know if you did it. There we go. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting take, but I feel like, as you said, they wrote themselves into a corner because how do you deal with the book then in the end? Yeah. They, and they ran out of ideas. I'll be honest. I wasn't satisfied with the ending. No, I wasn't either. Um, it left a lot very ambiguous mm -hmm. um the whole idea was that it was a sarah bellows rage at being treated so poorly that was manifesting this curse of this book yes which you know works in some films but i don't feel like it worked in this one a movie that did this particular style of ending a lot better uh was paranorman the mm -hmm. like the like a film um, oh, i love that one yeah it's great and it has a very similar plot element where the character in question that's led to be the antagonist is actually a sympathetic character. More spoilers. More spoilers. We're <laughs> spoiling two movies for the price of one today. <laughs> I'll also watch Paranorman because it's, it's so good. It's kind watch of awesome. it. It's yeah. fun. Uh, but regardless, uh, the ending of that movie plays very much up the angle of, okay, now in order to stop the curse that's on the town, we need to capitalize off of the sympathies of the villain uh, because they are a tragic villain and this is very much the case with this movie except it doesn't quite land and I think the problem is pacing for a movie like this that wrote itself into a corner the ending felt very rushed to me like it felt like the stakes were at a point where like they got heightened and then immediately dissipated mm -hmm. like within a matter of minutes it felt like it was just too easy yeah, it uh, it did feel a little bit rushed in the end. It felt, like I said, it it just feels like they wrote themselves into a corner, and well, it's a lot of that is because they did such a good job at the setup because the stakes and the level of terror and genuine threat that was developed over the course of the running time was so impressively done and so well realized that that particular ending which could have worked in another movie that with lesser quality mm. doesn't really pay off in this one because it it felt like it just kind of went burnt like it was very it fell it fell flat it was almost like yeah. you had a a musical uh, a musical piece that actually kind of just fell flat at the end someone messed up an instrument or something like that it was just like 
Womp womp. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, it, it was very kind of just like I shrugged my shoulders. That said, character motivations in this and the acting, spot on. Oh, I yeah. had no problems. I don't um, know where they're getting these child actors today. But I don't know, but do you they're remember when, awesome. Do you remember when child actors were like a problem in Hollywood? No, but I don't have much of a memory, so. Oh, God, I do. I remember they were the bane of existence. They I were, would have to. Like, just don't put kids in movies. But now be, this weird rush of just child actors that are in some cases better than their adult counterparts it true is kind of astounding to me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah no but the character motivations were all very genuine and there's also one of the characters ramon morales he's uh, a drifter it seems at first a teenage drifter which is a bit of an odd concept to me but who's going around and he joins up with this group and it turns out he's a draft dodger because this movie takes place in 1968 mm -hmm. which i don't think we mentioned previously we didn't know no that That's... character almost plays into like a political allegory or something I... in the movie that i wasn't expecting for a movie mm -hmm. that it, it, it's just it's it blew me away because it's not just a run-of-the-mill gateway horror film for for kids that it has layers there's actual there's good writing and production here oh, there on a level very... that has lasting effect. I feel like this movie could actually stand the test of time and really be something that people were, are reminded of 10 years from now and look back on with reverence. You know what? I would add this to my Halloween movie list. Absolutely. I was going to actually say the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's on my list now permanently because this is something I want to revisit and actually pay more attention to the details. And that's yeah. a nice segue into just how many details are in this movie yeah good lord the there production design alone oh yeah is it's astounding it's, it's amazing but i mean i'm not that surprised given who was working on it oh yeah like, you know like he's a master he really is del toro's fantastic he's my favorite um, like there's just no one working today that has that meticulous of an eye and can just build an entire scene for the shot mm -hmm. and everything feels so hand placed and yeah. textured and meticulously crafted to such a degree that nothing gets left behind. And there's so much tangibility to everything that he touches. And I mean, I don't want to entirely give credit just to Del Toro here because the director was brilliant behind the camera. Mm -hmm. Like this movie has like a swiftness. There's like a style to it, the way it's shot. And I got to give him credit because it, it's gorgeous looking. Like this whole thing is... Like right down to like the mansion, the look of the mansion right away when I saw that, I was like, that is a work of art. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the set pieces. <laughs> by set pieces, and do you the, really mean? Yeah. This is the part of the review where we start warning people uh, for fear and gross out warnings because this is, <laughs> this is where shit gets a little heavy. And uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, there were moments of this movie where I felt like turning away. Yeah. In a um, PG-13 horror film. Yeah, th that is the the creature designs in this. Yeah, were, I I mean I'm looking at my note here I have for myself and all I've got is ah jangly man why? I think the jangly man is going to be held in high esteem as oh, yeah. one of the go to examples of modern horror movie monster effects. I think there are. Okay, let's let's look at it this way. There were three monster monsters in yes. this movie. There was the the well, the first one we saw was Harold. the uh, the scarecrow yeah. Harold. He's on posters. You iconic. can see him. He's iconic. And yeah. uh, props to Del Toro to the, the in the and the creature department because they took the images. The books have sketches. Yep. In them. Oh, how can we forget those? And yeah, that Night. was pretty they're pretty creepy when i was a kid that those illustrations were nightmare fuel yeah you know what there were four there were four monsters yes yes they took the sketches though yes and they made them real identical to the drawings identical to the drawings and that is a bravo and b why <laughs> for someone <laughs> like myself who has a background in vfx and in, in illustration and drawing and, and sculpting to do that is actually very impressive because they were able to actualize the, these makeups with the full detail that you see in the illustrations, the original drawings from those books. And it's perfect. Like Harold looks identical to that really sort of misshapen, very, very 
abstract drawing. Mm -hmm. It's really impressive. And the fact that there's also a performer behind that makeup is even more impressive. Uh, the one that stood out to me the most, and this one's going to be a little weird for you uh, because I didn't really go into detail about this with anyone, but the short story that actually scared me probably the most when I was a kid was actually the dream. Oh yeah. Um, the <laughs> idea of something always being at the end of a hallway yeah. really sketches me out. Something at the end of the hallway that gets closer. Yes. You go to sleep and it's closer in the next dream. Oh God. And that illustration of that thing, like, and then was, he brought it to life. They brought it to it's life. It's so scary. And it it's is, because it's so oh. like, it's, it's, what is it again? It's like uncanny Valley because mm. it looks like something that's easily recognizable as just sort of like a almost gelatinous amoebic larger woman. Uh, but it has no distinct like human qualities that make it relatable it has everything is separated everything's super far apart like its eyes are stretched everything feels stretched and its hair is like greasy and hanging off of its head and that yeah. mouth looks like it's you can snake it's swallow you whole yeah and the ble the beady black eyes like yeah and the fact that it's smiling yeah no. everything about that is nightmare no. fuel i and, and the fact that they brought that to life and it actually sent shivers down my spine yeah. i was so uncomfortable yeah, no, it it was definitely unpleasant to look at. Yeah. And I got to say, you think that it would unhinge its jaw like a snake to swallow someone, but no, it just hugs you and then absorbs you That's so into it. And I think that the, the lighting on that shot in that scene was also brilliantly Amazing. done. So good. All The whole hallway of the hospital where the character Chuck encounters this pale woman mm -hmm. is all washed in red. It's just crimson. Oh, God. And the art direction you, in this movie. Oh, it was brilliant. Yeah. And when you add in the starkness of the woman and the black eyes and the black hair, like it just worked. It, it pops. Was, yeah. It popped. And it luckily didn't pop at me but you know <laughs> yeah fair enough uh so here's a question for you hallie uh which of the set pieces made you want to vomit in the theater more the big toe or the red spot oh really uh i mean and for those of you who don't know because you should know by the if you've seen the trailer the red spot was very heavily marketed very it's every teen's worst nightmare of getting that acne getting the pimple on your face and then and having it, something inside you yeah that coming out leg. that pimple oh, oh jesus yeah that's a good time yeah um you know i i can't choose skylar they were both really i can which one was it the big toe i oh. wanted to throw up everywhere <laughs> i'm glad you didn't i'm the, sitting right next they to you showed it it was disgusting like that for, as someone who likes to make potted dishes like chilies and soups frequently i can tell you right now that i'm gonna stir extra next time i cook because good lord the fact that i had to see that toe that disgusting corpse toe bloop to the top of that soup and then also watch a teenager eat it i wanted to throw up it was really bad and it this was pretty is great. again i need to stress to the audience this is a PG-13 horror film. PG-13. It it freaked me out. It made me feel sick. More so than any R-rated film has done in a little while. Like, it, it's really upsetting. Um, I, I'm kind of shocked. It's really effective. I'm just, I'm kind of blown away by this thing. Yeah, it really was a fun movie to go see and also terrifying. It was yeah, good. I it, enjoyed it. It's got all the ingredients that I would look for in a movie like this. It actually surpassed my expectations, barring the fact that like there are some, it's not perfect, of course, like the the writing really loses steam and especially the final act, like the yeah. last quarter really falls apart. It also kind of drudges up questions in the initial ending that I feel like didn't even need to be asked. Yeah, like, so... Good Lord. You know, at the yeah. end of the movie, Stella's lost what? two of her best friends yeah they're they're dead <laughs> well they're gone and she's like there's got to be a way to bring them back and for me that screams sequel yeah. and i don't like it when movies do that i understand money making i understand mm -hmm. sequels 
But be more subtle about it. Be more subtle about it or just don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Keep it nice and compact and self-contained because I want this movie to stand on its own two feet. I don't want it to be connected directly to a sequel that could be worse. Like it could yeah. be something that doesn't really land. And I mean, if you want to do something like that, follow the Jumanji route. Complete the story. Have the ending. Yep. And then have the book show up somewhere else. Yeah. Just it's, it, rewrite itself. Yeah. Somehow. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But other than that, great movie, fun times. Oh, terrific. And it's it's eye candy. It's got everything that I look for mm -hmm. in a movie like this where everything is so tangible and practically done. All of the performers are wonderful. The production design, the makeup is so detailed and wonderful. It, it, it pays attention to every tiny little facet of each sequence and it sets everything up and pays it off beautifully it's effective it's there's no other way to describe it other no. than that it's just genuinely effective good fun horror mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. totally on my halloween playlist um, 100 percent, yeah do we want to do numbers uh yeah i think we can do numbers now excellent as so, long as you don't send the jangly man after me oh god fuck that thing seriously uh, no, um, no. I, we, I don't even want to spoil you know i know this is a spoiler podcast but i actually don't want to spoil the yeah jangly you know what man. go see it go see it Go be afraid. That thing is upsetting. Oh let's my do God. numbers. Yeah, let's do numbers. All right. Um, do you want to start? Sure. All right. So, scary stories. Tell in the dark. 2019. I give 8.5. Whoa. What'd you give it? An 8.5. Oh my God. We so, matched up. How did we match we do up? That last I actually thought something? for sure. I'm not gonna lie. I thought you were gonna go like seven and a half what the on hell? this. Yeah. You were sitting right next to me in the theater, and I was having a good time. I guess I was so enamored with my own. Uh, like overwhelming response to this thing. I thought the ending really bugged you to a point where it was going to knock it down no. several points. I, d I deducted for it, but I did not knock it down a lot. Okay, cool. Uh, we're yeah, on the no. so we're totally on the same page. It was here. great. This, I enjoyed it. I, Go see it. I love this movie. I yeah. think uh, if you love genre cinema and you're looking for something spooky uh, for your Halloween playlists, go to this one. And also, this is great. The, for kids like if you want to actually i mean and i say that <laughs> maybe uh, not young maybe kids, not young maybe kids not, yeah don't yeah you know, 16 year old 14 15 16 somewhere yeah in there. like early teen preteen get if so if you've got a preteen kid at home who is interested in horror and really wants to kind of like dive knee deep into something that's a little bit challenging and grotesque this will really get their imaginations going it'll be really effective not only for them but for you, uh, it's it's something that just works on multiple levels. It's something that's accessible, which is yeah. very rare in this genre. Yeah, it's not often you get a horror movie that you can be like, oh, this is genuinely scary and I could actually take my kid to see this. Yeah, totally. It's fun. Yeah, love yeah. it. So uh, let's uh, hit up the next one. Absolutely. You know, Skylar, I think if there's one thing that people can take away from this podcast, it's that you should never read books. Yeah, I guess. Ever. That, that is kind of the lesson that we're bestowing upon our audience today isn't it at the very least don't touch books that don't belong to you yeah you're gonna really figure that out when i go through the synopsis of our next movie and what is our next movie skylar well you can tell i'm really excited uh to i talk sure about, can um oh god come on skylar out with it <sighs> goosebumps 2015 yeah is directed by is directed by rob letterman uh okay so here we go let me see if you can find some commonalities in this plot. And I feel like I should also mention, Skylar writes these synopses himself. Like, this this is his writing. Not We're not reading this off the internet or anything like no. that. This is him. This is out of my brain. That's it. Here we go. Okay, go ahead. So, young Zach Cooper, a big city kid who moves to a small town, finds a silver lining in his current predicament by crushing super hard on the girl next door. Her name is Hannah. Uh, however, Hannah's mysterious father is also R.L. Stein. It gets weirder. Uh, the writer of the best-selling children's horror series, uh, Goosebumps, creates, and he uh, he's wacky and weird, and he creates tension between the blossoming couple. Things really get out of hand when Zack accidentally unleashes a plethora of monsters from Stein's fantastical book collection in the stupidest way possible. Um, the crew must work together to capture all of the beasts and return them to the pages of the books where they belong. Accidentally, really. I don't think accidentally was the key there. More like he just smashes into all the books and opens them all like an idiot. Um, oh well, my God. Yeah. So, 
All right. Do we have to talk about this movie? We do. Yes. That's okay. why we're here, Skylar. Why we do I this know. every week. In case you didn't pick up on it, uh, this plot should sound very similar to you. Do you. Does it sound similar to a movie we just talked about? Maybe. That's why we picked it, right? Yeah. It's that pretty much it. the same movie. But there's a reason why, in all seriousness here, folks, there is a reason why we picked Goosebumps. Because it's almost like a what to do and what to not do do not just that they're both books from the 90s that, that we too like yeah i love goosebumps books Absolutely. as a kid and here's a fun bit of trivia for you skylar and for all the people listening do you know in total oh you better not have it in front of you how many goosebumps <laughs> books there are i was going to cheat <laughs> don't you dare guess how many books and i'm i'm including in this one spinoffs okay. and uh the main series so this is Go like ahead. one of those like yeah Guess how many marbles there are in the jar. That's right. Okay. How many Goosebumps books and spinoffs from the Goosebumps books? Do you think are there we are? using Price is Right rules? I guess I'm not playing against anyone. I'm not giving you anything for this. Oh, shit. Other okay. than, you know, maybe some kudos. Well, this sucks. All right. Um, let's go with 200. 235. I was close. You were close. I'm impressed. Specifically, the main Goosebumps books that we probably read during mm -hmm. our childhood from 92 to 97, there were 62 Goosebumps books in that time frame. Whoa. That's a lot. That is an insane amount of that books. That is an insane amount of books. That's like Stephen King level writing. I, yeah, it's, yeah. It's crazy. Um, and I loved them as a kid. Oh, yeah. So then Me to too. see this come to life as a movie... I'll, I'll admit there was some nostalgia because I also enjoyed the Goosebumps TV series mm -hmm. as a kid. Totally. Uh, every yeah. Halloween, YTV, I'd be sitting there glued to my TV watching all the scary shows that they had. Yes. This was too ambitious, though. Uh-huh. I think I would have preferred to see movie adaptations of books than one movie and all the books. Yeah. Trying to hit all of the books. Basically, everything that we loved about scary stories to tell in the dark doesn't work here and nope. there's a reason for that i mean several reasons in my opinion um <laughs> okay so i should preface this also before i come down a little hard on this movie that it is harmless fun it's not it is, it is for campy. us it's not really for us no it's not it's more for this is a movie that advertises itself and capitalizes off of nostalgia, but makes itself very clear that it is for a younger demographic. This movie is very much for little kids. It's not gateway horror. It's more, if, if anything, I would consider it to be more, it's fantasy adventure in, yeah. in that sort of vein. It's not, it doesn't sit into the genre of horror at all, even though the books are very much children's horror. Yeah. Um, and I mean... And that's fine. Yeah, it, that worked but you know acknowledging that it's not for our demographic yeah it is campy it's, it's silly and silly. weird and you've got look you've got jack black playing at the lead and i like jack black jack black is the best thing in this whole he's, movie he's delightful and he, I, he really does pull it i kind of together love him. for i it. think he's great he's hamming it up and playing this character so yeah. oddly you want ham you go to jack black he's yeah. good at it he does good ham it's there's something really cool about the way jack black performs as well like he doesn't take it like he takes it seriously so much to a point where he really just goes for like i guess hamming it up like he he always just finds a way to play a cartoon no matter what he's playing if that makes sense at all yeah. like he just tries his hardest to capitalize off the character and you can always tell that he's having fun so as a result the audience is having fun with him um, even if they can't stand, like, there are people I know that, like, find him a little grating and over the top constantly, but I think yeah. that's why he's so wonderful. In this, he was just the right level of eccentric yes. to make it enjoyable. Yeah. Now, <laughs> speaking to the plot, mm. if there was one big thing, mm -hmm. one glaring thing that I had an issue with mm. in the plot... Go on. It's the key. Uh -huh. Each of the books... so. The character, Zach, breaks into the house, essentially, or gets into the house and goes and looks in R.L. Stein's office, or this man's office, and finds row upon row of book on the shelves. Yes. And each book is locked. Now, if you had, as R.L. Stein's character did, uh, 
a collection of books that were locked because if you open them, all the monsters come out. It's a genuine threat. A genuine threat. Where, Skylar, would you keep the key? Certainly not in a glass case on a table. Right next to the bookcase? Yeah, I can't imagine that's a good place to have a key. That that's you a don't terrible want place to, to have a key. That's right up there. The only thing that was missing was the sign that said, don't take this key, wink, wink. Well, it kind of goes back to like our Annabelle review in a weird way, uh, where it's like yeah, character doing dumb thing mm-hmm. to unlock a series of events that creates chaos for the whole movie, but it's so poorly written and put together that it just feels forced. And that's yeah. the best way I can describe this movie is that I, there's a reason why I had to preface it in saying that it's not for us or not it's not made for us. But like, I still feel like you could make a movie for a younger demographic and also cater to an older audience and have good writing. Look at yeah. like the we we referenced Paranorman earlier. Paranorman yeah. is absolutely something that plays Delightful. to a younger audience, but it's so well written and so smart. It cares about. The audience. It actually mm-hmm. bothers to treat its audience with respect. Mm-hmm. This movie is kind of like a roller coaster. Like it's a thrill ride. It's meant to be more of like colorful, big, loud. It's an amusement park. It's an amusement park. It's an ride. amusement park. And that's fine. Like this that movie, by and large, is not. I mean, it, it commits a cardinal sin that we'll speak about later um, for me personally, and it's on a personal level. Uh, for oh, those of you who know our me, listeners you, are going to learn something oh, about Skylar today. Yeah, for those of you who already know me, you already know what I'm going to talk about, and I know but you're we'll wait- get to it. and I know you're waiting for me to talk about it. Oh, it's and those of you who don't know me, you're going to learn something about me that I'm sure you're going to use against me. Oh, very much, yeah. Um, okay, so to speak to the plot, I completely agree with you. Keys in a dumb place. I wish that there was a little more thought put into the setup that led to the monsters being unleashed from now, the books. Yeah, to be fair about that, though, he does only unleash one monster. Yes. And then... The, the abominable snowman. The abominable or, snowman. Yeah. And then Slappy. Oh, and that dummy from the Goosebumps series as a kid. Uh, that's another positive. for a while. Yeah, because that's another posit- positive for me on this movie. I actually really liked Slappy. And I think we were both blown away by the voice actor yes. for Slappy because we were both like, oh, that's got to be Mark Hamill. That's got to No. You know who that was, I... kids? That was Jack Black. Yeah. Voicing Slappy. I actually was stunned. It was It was. Great. I thought I had to go. I had to go over IMDb a couple times to yeah. make sure that that was correct because yeah. I didn't notice at first that he was credited twice as those two characters. And his vocal performance is really, really well done. Phenomenal. And I don't know if it's because we just watched a creepy doll movie with Mark Hamill kind of leading the charge there. But yeah, his vocal performance is excellent. He mm-hmm. really goes for it. And it doesn't sound anything like Jack Black. No, it really doesn't. So kudos to Jack Black on that one. Yeah. Uh, great job. In both his good character like, writing too. Yeah. It's, it's he's a genuinely fun villain. Like I can see him working <laughs> for a younger audience yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely a campy movie though. I I, don't, I wasn't. Yeah, and it's also got a. It's pretty much mixed across the board mm-hmm. because not all the performances are good. It's it's kind of just slapstick, silly nonsense. Basically, there's not much to talk about in terms of the plot because quite literally, it is just set piece connected to. Remember how earlier I was talking about how. The nostalgic book properties were seamlessly woven into scary stories Mm -hmm. to tell in the dark. This movie doesn't even try. It's just, okay, characters are driven by putting monsters back into books, but they're almost completely led by the nose, by the monsters themselves. Like they're constantly being put into scenarios where it's like, oh, crash, or a monster busts through a wall, and then Mm -hmm. they go through the motions of a set piece, and then they escape. And then they encounter another monster and then another monster. It's, yeah. it, it's less them doing the Fantastic Beasts thing of going to capture all the monsters and put them back in the books more so than it is just set pieces that are not connected together very well. Yeah. All playing out in a sequence. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It was, I think they were trying to do a nostalgia thing. Yes. Where the people, the kids who grew up with Goosebumps, the books, the series, what have you, Mm -hmm. they wanted to cater to that audience, that demographic, by having so many of these monsters in the movie. Yes. But it was too many. It was too many. It was too ambitious. And it was constantly like, remember this? Remember this? The movie was asking you. Do you remember this? Do you remember the gnomes? (sighs) 
Do we have to talk about this right now? We're going to get to that point now. All right. So here's what's up, people. I don't like garden gnomes. He doesn't like garden gnomes. They're fucked up. They are a little creepy. I don't want to get into too many details on why I don't like garden gnomes other than the fact that... Probably one of those books. They just upset me on a level. (laughs) I can't look at them without wanting to leave. There's a point in this movie where it's playing off of one of my least favorite books of all time, uh, uh, Night of the living garden gnome or whatever the hell it's called. I don't care. Cause I don't think I finished the book. It freaks me out. Like they come to life at night. First of all, garden gnomes, no one likes yard work that much. Seriously. That's upsetting on a level that I can't even begin to describe to you. Like they're, they're creepy old, small, tiny old men with beady eyes and they come to life. And there's a sequence in this movie where there's an onslaught of them. And my nightmares are realized in full color and detail and formation on and i i i think this is usually where i check out of the movie because i'm not gonna lie i've had to watch this movie twice because when it gets to the gnome part i have to turn it off <laughs> please don't use this against me please don't send Skyler, me gnome related memes you know they're gonna do that right keep the memes to a minimum just be thankful we don't have an actual studio yet because you know we'd be getting gnomes in the oh i've had now. people threaten to put garden gnomes on my front porch at the very least, I feel like your students are going to leave a bunch of gnomes on your desk now. They already did that. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. So there's you. one particular scene this movie's got where I'm like, ah, you got me, movie. But that's on a personal level. Yeah. It's a, it's it's upsetting it's to a, me. It's not a practical level. It's just, ah, you hit a nerve with you that one. You hit a nerve with that one, yeah. And other than that, though, uh, to speak to the rest of the movie about effectiveness of effects. Because I could gush about scary stories to tell in the dark for days. This movie... I kind of don't even want to talk about it because the effects are so mixed and uneven across the board. Some effects work, some really, really don't. Like they're dated Mm -hmm. instantly. Like they feel like they're, this movie came out in 2015. They feel like they came out in 2005. Yeah. I'm talking like the abominable snowman is the entry level creature that we see. And right away, like my eyes were ripping it apart. The fur didn't look good. The lighting was bad. This movie is really garish. It doesn't have a distinct style. It doesn't have a color tone or a grade that makes any sense. The scenes are just kind of like washed with vibrancy. And my eyes just, they don't, I don't know what to look at. And again, that it comes back to that amusement park feel. Yeah, it's sensory overload is what it it is. is. It's sensory overload. There's so much going on that it's kind of hard to follow what you should follow. Absolutely. There's something fun to be had about seeing the the realization of these famous books that really nostalgically connected with us as, as children. Like I love the Goosebumps books as well. I was obsessed actually. Yeah. I, I love them. It was, I couldn't get enough of anything horror when I was a kid because mm-hmm. it just sparked my imagination. I was, I was that kid yeah. that really enjoyed that content. Yeah. I think I was, I was the same way. Like I think before I picked up a Goosebumps book, I wasn't really a fan of reading. Mostly because I was being made to read boring books. Dribble, right? yeah. yeah. And then I picked up a Goosebumps book and instantly fell in love. So, I mean, R.L. Stein was uh, an influence on me as a writer, but I think more importantly, he was an influence on me as a reader. Like, he just sparked my want to read. I don't even know how many of his books I have. Well, there was just so much to pick from, and there was something for everybody because he has such a volume like you mentioned it earlier, he's got 200 and some books and he had like in our time, like 60 mm-hmm. some books available to us that yeah. are each one just sparking your imaginations one after another. Yeah. And he didn't do just like monsters and ghosts and things. He also did some, uh, I think some slasher style or some yeah, killer. There was, there was definitely some inspirations across the board on this yeah. one. There was enough to pick from that there was something there for everybody. Mm-hmm. And there, it, odds are there was... There was a Goosebumps book that triggered you on the same level that the, the Gnome book did for me. Like, it really left a mark. Yeah. So, couldn't really praise the source material that this movie is based on enough. It's it's mm-hmm. wonderful, and I think it's... I think these movie or these books stand the test of time for kids even today. Like, they can go back and read those stories, and they're just as effective. Oh, yeah. No, um, they're still great books. The movie associated with this is... It's like you said, it's a theme park ride for kids. It is. Um, it's, it it's a haunted house ride for kids. It's not yeah. meant for 30-somethings who are reviewing it for no, a No, it's not for us. It's charming <laughs> on the quirkiest level. It's meant to be something that's eye candy. 
it's like too it's almost like candy that's too sweet almost. with a hint of nostalgia thrown in that's right yeah and that's that's about it really i mean i i don't have a whole lot else to say on this no, movie me neither um it's good for kids yeah go for it yeah pretty much it's 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 just a series of set pieces and you'll either have fun with it or you'll want to turn it off about halfway through especially if there are gnomes it's a netflix movie is what it is mm -hmm. i'm gonna ignore what you said <laughs> i noticed that all right, so I guess we, wow, uh, yeah, we're gonna, just going to launch right into ratings then, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? I went first last time. You go ahead, okay. Skylar. Uh, I mean, take this with a grain of salt. If you've got some kids that are looking for some sensory overload, colors blasted into their eyes, uh, some fun, charming, a fun, charming romp in the fantasy adventure variety you turn to this movie you there it's harmless it's not gonna offend anybody it's perfectly entertaining in its own right for a certain audience for me i'm giving it a six out of ten it's something it's a, a low-ish mediocre i think it, it just barely passes for me on that level you know what we were actually pretty close i gave it a 6.5 okay cool yeah, yeah we're pretty yeah. on point today yeah um, this is a this was a good day yeah well, that about wraps up everything we want to talk about today. Uh, yeah. The theme being uh, books are can be wonderful and deadly things. I True guess. story. Yeah. yeah. Don't don't read or maybe read more. Who knows? Like I I just don't know. So yeah. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We're really happy to uh, to have everybody here, and we're happy to be keeping doing this. Um, if you'd like to follow us, you can follow us Facebook Eldritch Creative. We have a group there. Uh, leave comments if you have ideas for movies we should talk about and review hit us up leave something there we have instagram eldritch.creative and twitter eldritch create also our podcast is now available spotify apple podcasts or we're on there now and we should be on google Podcasts soon i'm not sure we'll see but thank you for tuning in yeah thanks to everyone and the the growing community uh we're really excited to bring this show to you and we look forward to doing more yeah so thanks a lot and we'll see you next time see you next time bye, bye.